Hello, uh, and welcome to the PAMI webinar on common misconceptions of SUDEP. I'm Gardner Lapham, and I'm pleased to be the moderator here. I'm also honored to be part of the PAMI Collaborative, whose mission is to convene, educate, and inspire all stakeholders to promote understanding and drive prevention of epilepsy-related mortality. And before we dive in, I want to thank our sponsors. And do you mind um, advancing the slide for me? Thanks. Uh, without this broad show of support, there would really be no PAMI Collaborative. So many thanks to our nonprofit foundation and industry partners. I also want to offer a special note of thanks to AES, who houses this initiative and provides significant pro bono management assistance. Okay, so I came to this cause after losing my son to SUDEP 15 years ago. Sadly, the theme for this webinar, Misconceptions of SUDEP, is as relevant today as it was when Henry died. While prog progress has been made on many fronts, misunderstandings, misbeliefs, and misconceptions persist. If we are to make real progress, getting correct information out there is imperative. Accurate information is also essential because it eases fear and promotes empowerment. I'd like to welcome our amazing speakers today. So first we will hear from Lou Brossard. Lou and his family have been staunch advocates for SUDEP awareness since losing their daughter Brenna in January of 2022. Since then, he and his family have focused their efforts on helping assist, to assist those living with epilepsy in their Cleveland, Ohio area community. And from those local activities stem their statewide efforts to bring about SUDEP awareness and advocacy with the hope that awareness will lead to potential prevention for other families. Lou has also become a frequent contributor to na national work groups who meet regularly to brainstorm about SUDEP. So thank you, Lou, for being part of this. And you're really quite amazing in all that you've done in this short time. And, and we're really so deeply sorry for your loss. And before you speak, Lou, I'm just going to introduce um, Dr. Davinsky and then um, turn it over to both of you. So um, Oren Davinsky is the director of the NYU Comprehensive Epilepsy Center. He's a professor of neurology and neuroscience at NYU Langone School of Medicine and has been a leader in SUDEP research. He founded the North American SUDEP Registry, played a central role in the uh, NIH Center for SUDEP Research, and has authored many, many papers on SUDEP. He's been a true uh, leader in the field, and we're very lucky to have him here today. So after the two of them um, both present, I'll moderate a question and answer session. Um, so please um, use the question box to submit some questions, and remember to keep them applicable to others as we're not able to provide specific medical advice. And please also feel free to use the chat to connect with other attendees. And a recording of this webinar will be made available um, in 24 hours. Okay, so enough of the logistics. I will pass it over to Lou. And thank you all again for being here. Uh, thank you, Gardner. Um, and I'm proud to call you friend yeah, as well as collaborator. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and a happy Friday to you as well. Uh, my name is Lou Brossard, uh, and I want to start by mentioning my family, um, my wife, Joni, our son, Nicholas, and his wife, Marissa, and our daughter, Devin, and her husband, Kyle. We have all become, as uh, Gardner indicated, staunch advocates for SUDEP awareness, and I'm grateful for the opportunity today to kind of share a bereaved parent perspective about SUDEP. Um, and that's because our lives changed suddenly and irrevocably on January 30th of 2022, when we lost our daughter Brenna at age 25 to SUDEP. Uh, at the time of her passing, Brenna was a very healthy, active and physically fit 25 year old who was absolutely thriving in her post-college dream job at American Greetings Corporation. Um, I'm biased, but she was strikingly beautiful. Uh, and she was certainly adored by her vast network of family, friends, and coworkers. And no one saw this coming. No one saw this coming, despite the fact that our family has been living with epilepsy for over 26 years. Uh, our oldest child, our son Nicholas, who is now 30 years old, 
was first diagnosed with epilepsy at the age of four in 1996. Uh, and then later in our family's epilepsy journey, uh, Brenna surprisingly developed epilepsy of her own when she was 15 years old in 2012. Um, so dur during 26 years of doctor visits with neurologists and epileptologists for both Nicholas and Brenna, we had never even heard the term SUDEP until a week after Brenna's funeral when during a visit to the Epilepsy Association of Cleveland, where we were invited, they rhetorically asked my wife and I if Brenna had passed away from SUDEP. We were dumbfounded. We had no idea what they were referring to, had never heard the term. So when it was explained to us what SUDEP was, we were just so overcome by confusion, disbelief, and a, a great sense of disappointment at never having been informed by any of our kids treating physicians that something like SUDEP could possibly occur, let alone informing us of the steps that we could potentially take to potentially mitigate the risks of it happening. So let that sink in for just a moment. 26 years of visits with neurologists and epileptologists, all of those seemingly omitted opportunities to inform us about SUDEP. So uh, shortly after that re revelation, I spoke at length with the medical examiner who performed Brennan's autopsy. And he readily admitted to me that he and his colleagues are not formally trained on what to look for with regard to SUDEP. Uh, this was shocking to me as this particular medical examiner's division serves the city of Cleveland, as well as the largest county in the state of Ohio. So that's about 1.25 million people that this medical examiner's division serves. So if this large medical examiner's division is missing cases of SUDEP, it stands to reason that others are too. Uh, and that means that SUDEP deaths are likely very much underreported which means that SUDEP is likely missing out on vital research funding. Um, so despite this cycle of frustration early on, we ultimately decided that if we were gonna be able to move forward from this tragedy as a family, we needed to get involved with epilepsy and SUDEP advocacy and awareness efforts. Uh, and to that end, uh, I'm proud to say that our family has been quite busy. Uh, just a few examples. In lieu of flowers at Brenna's services, we had requested that people consider donating to the Epilepsy Association of Cleveland. And the, the irony of that is that we knew nothing about the Epilepsy Association of Cleveland. We simply chose them based on a quick Google search. Um, but within two weeks, a combination of friends, family members, co-workers of Brenna, and complete strangers had contributed over $30,000 to the Epilepsy Association. So shortly thereafter, it was my honor to be appointed to their board of directors. Um, and then I was asked to be the chairperson of their annual Winter Walk fundraising event, which is one of uh, three or four big fundraiser events that they host throughout the year. And on Jan uh, January 28th, of this year, that event raised over $55,000. And I'm happy to say that all those proceeds will help those living with epilepsy in the Northeast Ohio community. Um, now, I guess I'm showing my age a little bit when I say I'm not very active in uh, social media. Uh, I consider LinkedIn to be social media. So that's pretty much what I gravitate to. So uh, my LinkedIn post about Brenna's passing, along with an appeal for epilepsy awareness, it apparently went viral, and it generated over 1.25 million views. Um, and that very same LinkedIn post led to thousands of amazing and compassionate epilepsy warriors who personally reached out to me, including people like our very own Gardner Lapham, Allison Kukla, John Popovich, Sally Schaefer, Barb Casey, Kelly Jankowski, and Libby Boyce, just to name a few. 
and all of their advocacy efforts have inspired my family to not just dip our toes in the water, but to jump in headfirst, both locally and nationally. Um, now, I, I have to admit, though, uh, uh, that I'm a little bit fortunate to have a platform that I can util utilize for those advocacy and awareness efforts based on my over 14 years involvement in Cleveland area politics. Um, so I decided to put my media contacts and relationships to good use by asking the Cleveland area newspapers and television stations to run uh, several human interest stories about Brenna and suit up awareness. Uh, and to date, we've been able to get four very well-written news articles on the topic. And uh, we also did a TV news interview that took place on March 26th, which, as many people know, is Purple Day, the Global Epilepsy Awareness Day. Uh, more recently, I approached our state representative in the Ohio House of Representatives, and uh, what resulted was Ohio House Bill 731, which is also known as Brenna's Law, uh, which proclaimed this past October 26th as Suit Up Awareness Day in the state of Ohio. Um, the support that we have received regarding House Bill 731 was so strong that we decided to try and take it to the next level. So we are currently in discussions with our state rep representatives to soon introduce a companion bill to the Ohio House of Representatives. And this bill would actually require neurologists and treating physicians to actually inform their patients about the risk of SUDEP, uh, because right now there is no such requirement. So I don't know if this bill uh, will pass. I don't know if it will be well received or not, but in our hearts, we believe that awareness can and will lead to prevention of SUDEP in some instances. Uh, and for that reason alone, we feel that it is incumbent upon neurologists and epileptologists to inform their patients about the potential risks of SUDEP. Uh, so I want to thank you for listening to Brenna's story and to our family journey that has resulted. Uh, and with that, I'll let Gardner introduce the main attraction for today's webinar, my new friend, Dr. Orrin Davinsky. Lou, you are the main attraction. Um, and please check the chat box because there's some really nice words from the audience um, and condolences. And I've already um, introduced Orrin, so I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Davinsky to um, tell us about all these misconceptions. Well, thank you, Gardner. And Lou, thank you for for sharing. I know it's hard, and I know you and Gardner have both done amazing things to move this field forward. So I'm going to talk about misconceptions as an epilepsy doctor who has been involved with the care of people with epilepsy for more than three decades and for the last 15 years or so have been very involved in trying to promote SUDEP awareness uh, and research what we can do to reduce it. So just conception of misconception number one, it's rare. Um, rare is a relative thing, but if you have epilepsy, it's a concern. Um, the risk of someone dying prematurely with epilepsy is 11-fold greater. Um, for those people who have epilepsy beginning in childhood and continue to have it, it's a 40-year follow-up study from Scandinavia, most of those deaths uh, were epilepsy-related with SUDEP being uh, the largest one together with seizure, single seizure status and drowning. But when you look, and this is one of the things that amazed me when I first started speaking to medical examiners who would tell me my patient who was 29 and clearly died of SUDEP and the autopsy was negative, well, there was a little bit of a plaque in one of their coronary arteries, so they probably died of cardiac disease. And I said, wait, this person never had high blood pressure, never had abnormal lipid profile, and the risk of sudden death among people with epilepsy is 27-fold greater than the general population. So you just think a healthy 29-year-old died in his sleep from heart disease, which would be rare for a 60-year-old. Um, and, and I think, so one of the misconceptions is that it really is more common. Uh, for people with epilepsy dying from a natural cause, which means something like a seizure or status epilepticus is more than 15-fold greater. 
But then there are many other causes. And, and I think that's an important message for this audience as well, is that there are deaths due directly to seizures, which suit up as the most common one, status or prolonged seizures is another one. And then the ones we all fear, you know, someone has a, gets a license to drive at age 16 or 17, has a seizure which may not be convulsive, may just cause impairment of awareness, and that can be deadly. Uh, and then accidents, falls, burns, falling off of something uh, resulting from a seizure can unfortunately be deadly as well. And then there are all the categories that just never get counted by anybody. Um, and unfortunately, counting, as Lou hinted at, matters because it, it matters in how Congress and the NIH allocate funding. So there are what are called acute symptomatic seizures. Someone develops, let's say, meningitis and has a first seizure, and they die of that seizure. That seizure will never get counted as epilepsy related or even seizure related. The medical examiner will always go with the more dramatic meningitis or encephalitis. Um, there are deaths that are secondarily effects of seizures, but they don't follow immediately from a seizure. The most common one is probably aspiration pneumonia, which is something like tenfold greater among individuals with epilepsy, especially those with developmental disabilities such as Dravet syndrome or Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. Suicide rates among people with epilepsy are far greater, partly due to epilepsy-related comorbidities like depression, uh, but also from medications that are used uh, that can make this more likely. And some seizure medications also increase the risk of cardiovascular disease. And then there are deaths due to the underlying neurologic disorder, which almost always get counted, even if it's a seizure, that is the mechanism of death. So if someone has a brain tumor and has a seizure and dies immediately after the seizure, the medical examiner will always code that as a brain tumor related death. And epilepsy often won't even make it on the death certificate or in the autopsy report. So these are just places where number one, we as a community need to, to release ourselves from the magnet of SUDEP, which is horrific and beyond imaginable as Lou and Gardner know better than I do. But to recognize that epilepsy unfortunately kills at least as many people from these other causes. Another misconception is that seizures um, and SUDEP are more or less the same in how they affect different groups of people. So one study for me, which was very eye-opening, was that individuals who have low socioeconomic status, and I'll get to this later as well, die much more frequently of SUDEP and pretty much everything else. So in Ohio, where... Uh, colleagues of mine did this study, Sam Lautu and others, uh, Kara Boone, uh, they found that in the people who are insured with Medicaid, if you're a young adult, you die 17 years prematurely now. Think about smoking. If you smoke from age 15 to 70, you'll die seven years prematurely. You have epilepsy and you're poor in the United States, you die 17 years prematurely. And this excludes things like aspiration pneumonia, which is a sevenfold greater risk in this population, suicide greater than threefold risk, et cetera. And then some of those other, I mentioned the, the natural causes, well, medical examiners use a term external causes. Um, and these are also very, unfortunately, increased among the epilepsy population, most of whom for these external causes have some psychiatric comorbidity, which again is very prevalent among people with epilepsy suicide, car accident deaths, uh, drug poisoning, falls, drowning, and assault are all more common ways for people with epilepsy to die, uh, substantially more common than in the general population. And this was a study done in Europe. So it's this is not just the US. Another misconception, which uh, I know is in the chat discussion already as I was listening to Lou, was that SUDEP affects mainly drug resistant adult patients usually conceived of as young adult. And this is from a slide from a paper I wrote a decade ago in the New England Journal. And you can see this was the traditional view of the epidemiology that, you know, when you get to the really resistant patients with uh, don't respond to medications or have to have brain surgery, uh, SUDEP rates go up dramatically from a community rate of like one per thousand per year to up to five or six or more per thousand per year. But I think this was misleading. 
Subsequent studies have shown both from Sweden and Ontario that children are affected with SUDEP, sadly, almost as often as young adults. Um, so the Swedish study found a rate, and I'll just point these numbers out on the bottom. Under age 16, it's about 1.1 per thousand person years. Young adults, the 16 to 50 age group, essentially identical. Over age 50, it was 1.3, so slightly higher. Uh, what I would say is in the over 50 category, the SUDEP rate, in my view, is probably most underestimated because everyone has atherosclerosis. I'm sure if you, I, I know I did a calcium test and I've got a drop of calcium in my coronary arteries. I don't think there's anyone over 50 in America who doesn't. So if a medical examiner does an autopsy, they are incredibly biased towards physical, that's their job. They do an autopsy, they're there to find a cause. And if they can't find a toxic level of opiates in the blood, then they darn well better find it somewhere in the body. And it's usually gonna be the heart or the lungs. And so almost everyone who dies over 50 gets labeled as having died from heart disease by a medical examiner because none of us have perfectly beautiful arteries. And then Elizabeth Donner and her colleagues did a very similar study and found almost identical rates in children in Ontario. So what's remarkable about medicine is don't believe things even if they're published in good journals because the truth always bubbles to the surface. And I think we know that children are by no means immune from SUDEP. Uh, and this is a series done by some colleagues here at NYU of what is considered the most benign form of epilepsy. This is a form of epilepsy, benign epilepsy with centrotemporal spikes or benign Rolandic epilepsy. You know, I, I love to, I hate to diagnose any epilepsy, but if I'm going to diagnose it, I like this one because I can look at the mom or dad and tell them, look, 99% of the time, your kid's going to outgrow this by the time they're 16. The problem is some of these children die of SUDEP. So these were three cases and these are classic. Um, none of the patients were on meds and in Europe and Canada, that's the standard in America. We probably use medications more frequently, but because seizures are infrequent and the child outgrows it, there's a sense that they don't need meds. And these were three cases uh, in our North American SUDEP registry, one of whom was my patient who's Father was a doctor and, you know, beyond devastating. And they really didn't want their kid on medications. And I did tell them there are risks. I, you know, it goes back 15 years ago. I don't think I probably explicitly discussed SUDEPs, but I said that there could be serious injuries and danger, and they decided not to do it. And that was a reasonable decision. And these are, I think, something we should consider. I think awareness is a must. What people do with it is what they do and what parents would like to be done with it and what a 14 or 19 year old in college wants to do with it are very, very different things. So misconception number four, I think Lou has spoken to more powerfully than I ever can, but it's that neurologists learn to talk about it. So this is a survey done by a neurology resident and fellow at the time, and who surveyed about 330 neurology residents in America and then internationally. And although many of them did know risk factors, about two thirds of non-US and 61%, only about two thirds understood anything about prevention. Only 50% uh, counseled their patients more than rarely or never. Um, and only less than 45% of all of these were actually educated about SUDEP during their training. So this is a this is from 2021. This is recent. So unfortunately, the the problems still remain. And this is the other half of misconception number four that neurologists talk about it. And I think you know Lou and Gardner both experienced this in their lives. But this is a survey Dan Friedman at NYU did uh, published in 2014. Twelve percent of neurologists never discuss SUDEP. Twenty one percent talk about it more than 50% of the time. So you're talking about 80% of neurologists rarely talk about it. Um, and then a subsequent study we did, published about four years ago, five, I'm sorry, six years ago, was on the first 138 SUDEPs that we collected in the North American SUDEP registry. And sadly, only 18% of the next of kin had been told about SUDEP when we interviewed them for this. So it just goes to speak that, you know, the education of both neurologists and neurology residents about SUDEP 
and the ability of neurologists and epilepsy doctors to translate that into action remains terrible in my view. It's a failure of the system, but one that uh, is challenging. It's, it's hard to change people's behavior. Just look at the obesity epidemic. I think I know how to do it, but nobody you know, wants to hear that they should consume less sugar and white flour. Another misconception is that we understand SUDEP and we don't. We have a good sense about it. We know that most SUDEPs do follow convulsive seizures. Two thirds of them occur during sleep related periods, although we only spend unfortunately less than a third of our time in sleep. So sleep is a very high risk period in part because seizures are common either during sleep or during transition into or out of sleep. Um, and we know genetic factors relate, but we don't really know if they're related beyond severe epilepsy. So if you look at some of the epileptic encephalopathies like Dravet syndrome, SEN2A and 8A, we know that the SUDEP rates are dramatically higher in those disorders. But the question is, are they elevated because those kids have terrible epilepsy or are they elevated because there's something special about what those genes do in the brain and affect how the individual is affected? by the seizure. So what we do know is that most SUDEPs we think occur following a convulsive seizure, often but by no means always related to sleep, through some combination of different mechanisms. And I think the leading two in my mind are a shutdown of the brain. And if you can see in this figure towards the bottom of the brain is the brainstem. And there are the centers that are responsible for arousal. So as I say to some people, if I went into your bedroom at three in the morning and put my hand over Lou's mouth and nose, you know, 20 seconds later, his carbon dioxide level in the blood would go up 30 seconds later. Um, he'd probably wiggle a little bit. And another 15 seconds later, he would arouse. He'd wake up and he'd start, you know, hitting me or pushing me away uh, because we have a reflex to detect when our life is at risk, which what happens when you stop breathing. But after a seizure, those arousal centers, as well as the respiratory centers that stimulate us to breathe, can both be essentially in the off position. And if that's combined with a tragic position of the seizure that leads the person to flip over and they're face down on their bedding, on their pillow or their sheets, now you've got this terribly perfect storm of depressed arousal, depressed respiration, um, and then often the heart will be affected secondarily, but we think it's usually later in the cascade that leads to death. Having said all this, we still don't know why it happens. Why is it that some people will have literally 500 convulsive seizures and just keep marching along year after year, while others have one or two convulsive seizures and die from them? So it remains unknown. And this is, again, the idea that SUDEP is one thing. It's not one thing. It affects, and getting to some of the questions in the chat group, everybody's at risk. Everybody's at risk. Everyone on this webinar, if you've never had a seizure, is at risk because your first seizure, you may not qualify for the diagnosis of epilepsy, but it can kill you as if you've had five or 10 or 100 seizures. So they are sleep-related, but one-third are not. Most follow seizures, but we know uh, Sam Lautu and a group of us wrote a paper on three unfortunate cases of people who had essentially a SUDEP on video EEG, but no seizure preceded the death. So they just died. The EEG showed no seizure. There was no behavioral changes suggesting a seizure. Those are very rare, but it just goes to speak to the depth of the spectrum, just like those benign Rolandic patients who I would have never imagined 20 years ago could ever die from SUDEP. It was just, I just thought SUDEP affected more severe patients, drug resistant patients. And like I said, some drug resistant patients um, survive so many seizures while others die after one or two. And I think that's a clue for us. That's one of the places we should focus research. Why is it? What are the differences between those people who survive 500 convulsive seizures and those who die after one or two? There's gotta be some clues into the mechanism. And then there are other things like some uh, researchers have identified laryngospasm in very rare cases where the seizure causes the vocal cords to contract and they don't let go and the person can't move air in or out. So again, the idea that they're suit up for one child or one adult is the same as another is, is a misconception. We have to think of it as having multiple mechanisms that interact and you know, alcohol withdrawal, drug withdrawal from uh, Valium related drugs probably also contribute in some cases, but it's a complicated 
mixed or heterogeneous, which is the word doctors like to use, set of mechanisms that contribute. And then epidemiology, you know, we've touched on this, uh, but this is a slide from David Thurman's paper. And on the top figure, you can see that stroke is the leading cause of lost potential years of life. Um, but SUDEP alone comes in number set number two of all neurologic disorders ahead of ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's, et cetera. Part of this is determined by when the death occurs. So someone with Alzheimer's or Parkinson's is probably over age 60 or 70, which means their potential life years is, is smaller. If a 15 or 20 year old dies from SUDEP, their life expectancy may be in their mid to late 70s or early 80s. And so you've lost a huge number of years. So that's one way to look at it. Uh, the age range in the slide below, I think is probably wrong. As we've learned, uh, unfortunately, younger people are probably more common. And I know for sure older people are more common. We just, we just don't count those cases. So as Lou mentioned, there's no doubt the official numbers are terrible, terrible underestimates of SUDEP. Another misconception is that SUDEP can always be prevented. Um, and I know some families live with horrible guilt if someone only told me, um, and I think they're right to be mad, as Lou expressed, he has every right, and Gardner, I think, went through this as well, that no one mentioned this. And if someone mentioned it, they could have used a sound monitor, they could have gotten an embrace watch in the modern world, and it might well, and I think they do prevent pseudops. I don't have a black and white scientific answer, uh, but I think most SUDEPs probably can be prevented, but I don't think they all can be prevented. I know of cases that occurred in medical ICUs. I know of other cases that have occurred in doctor's offices where CP, you know, it was not during sleep, it was witnessed, and medical care was, was rapid, if not immediate, and the individual still died. So it's part of what I'm saying in that SUDEP's not one thing. I think many, many, many SUDEPs can probably be prevented by going into a bedroom of someone who just had a seizure, rolled over face down in the prone position, and probably just rolling that person over and gently saying, you know, Molly, Stephen, wake up, probably is life-saving. But in other cases, you could literally have an intensive care doctor with a whole team and a crash cart, and they can't be saved. So it's just, it's not one one disorder and one thing. And then the other is that it can't be prevented. And I think part of this gets to what Lou was discussing, not just do we need to discuss it, but it's how we discuss it. So motor vehicle deaths is something that's a huge, huge problem, You know, the most common cause of death for most young people and young adults. And there's different ways and it's been studied. So if you tell a teenager who's starting to drive, hey, one out of every 3.5 million trips can kill you. They'll look at you and laugh. One in, one in three and a half million, I, it's not my worry. People don't understand those numbers. People understand stories. People understand individuals. They don't understand big numbers. Over 50 years, if you tell them there's a 1% chance you'll die in a car and a 33% chance you'll have an accident dis that disables you, that does significantly change seatbelt wearing behavior among young adults. And in the same way, I think the numbers that we tend to publish in papers, the one per thousand patient years are meaningless to people. It just doesn't, doesn't have a way to translate into their life. One in a thousand is a tiny number. And you just assume you or your kid will be one of the lucky 999. But I think a better way to say it is if you have well-controlled epilepsy, you have a 1% risk of dying per pseudo per decade. And if you're 20, 1% is not a good number. It's a horrible number. And if you have treatment-resistant, drug-resistant epilepsy, it's about five-fold that number. So again, these are huge numbers. If you're 90, you can live with this. If you're 20 or 30 or 40, I would not want to live with those numbers. So I think we have to be better, not just in getting awareness out, but how do we communicate it so that people care? If you say to a 19-year-old, don't drink, get good sleep, take your meds, which I can tell you they're terrible at. I take care of these people day in and day out. And young adults like to deny things. They want to do what their peer group does. They're very influenced by their peer group. And if you're in college, Thursday, Friday, Saturday nights are drinking and stay up late nights for many, many people, not everybody, but many. So part of it's helping 
these young adults to navigate their peer group, which can be really challenging. Their peers just wake up with a hangover and don't have a great day the next day. Our patients, people with epilepsy, can end up dead from one night of that behavior. So who dies from SUDEP? I hinted at this before, but poor people are at greater risk, more than tenfold um, among poor people in the Ohio Medicaid study. This is a paper Dan Friedman did in New York City, and, and essentially what it shows is the hot zones. The hot zones are low zip code areas, zip codes where people's incomes are low, uh, and the rates of SUDEP were far higher in those areas. What is what are we doing about disparities? Well, there are a lot of movements, as you know, for healthcare equity. And NIH, this is just one snapshot in 2013. That year alone gave a $40 million grant to reduce stroke disparities. Hypertension is a major issue among Black individuals, men more than women, who have very high stroke rates. So they invested $40 million to do education about hypertension. What have they done? for epilepsy disparities in the last, not just 2013, but 14, 15, all the way to 2023, they've done nothing. So it's an area in America we should be ashamed of ourselves. We have a healthcare system that we know has been prioritized towards white, male, wealthy individuals, but it really underserves so many people. And then it's a priority. Um, Sudden infant death syndrome in the last 20 years has received more than $500 million from the NIH and from the CDC with health campaigns, awareness campaigns, back to sleep, safe to sleep. Um, but it kills 1,500 people a year. Not that that's trivial, it's a huge number. SUDEP kills way more than 3,000 people per year and has probably received 10% of the funding, although the numbers are doubled. So again, I think this is where we need to be a louder voice politically um, at a national level and make sure the funding that's deserved for our group gets there. Because these numbers are not the right numbers. It's probably more like five or 6,000 per year. But regardless, it's way under-recognized, underfunded, and we're probably putting the funding in the wrong place. A lot of the groups that need it the most are not the groups that show up at the PAMI meeting. They're not the groups that show up at the Epilepsy Foundation board or the Cure board. So I think that's one of the places from my perspective, having been in this for 20 years, where we could do more. And this is just a slide showing that you can see the circles are the high socioeconomic, the triangles are the low, uh, and this looks across three different jurisdictions, New York City, the state of Maryland, and San Diego County, where we happen to have active surveillance for a period of time. Um, the great news for everybody is that SUDEP rates are going down over time. If you look at 09 to 10 to 14, 15, the rates have gone down. And I think that, in fairness, is because of people like Gene Donalty and Gardner, who have been campaigning this way since 2009. And I think awareness has grown. Uh, Lou, you're right. It's still way where, under where it should be, and that remains. But I can tell you, I see patients come in for their first visit and they've read about SUDEP because of the parents, not because of the doctors. And again, this just slide shows, you know, with some hope that I think parents have made a difference. This is not the medical community. Um, unfortunately, this is, this is CURE, this is the Band Foundation, this is PAMI and Epilepsy Foundation. These are the, this is the influence of lay groups. Do I know that 100%? No. But I, as much as I would put my nickel on the table and bet, I think it's because of people on this webinar who are both participants and listening. This is your legacy of hopefully saving lives that you'll never meet. And then can detecting seizures save lives? Yes, I think they can. Danny did has a great website on many, many different seizure detection devices. Um, I'm not sure the pillows, the anti-suffocation pillows work. It's we don't know, probably does no harm. I just don't know it does any benefit. And we need clinical trials. To date, there's not been one study internationally to look at, do these devices decrease SUDEP risk? We, we think they probably do. I believe they do. But, you know, this is science and you may believe in God, but everybody else has to show the data. And I think we need to do a better job scientifically and study SUDEP prevention or reduction interventions to see how we can intervene and save lives. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and talking and I think open it up. There were a large number of pre-questions and I'm sure some more 
have rolled in. Uh, so Gardner, off to you. Okay. Wow. Thank you so much, Oren. That was that was really great, and I'm overwhelmed by all the questions. I mean, and as you said, there were a bunch that were submitted when people registered. So, um, so I'm so glad we're having this webinar because there there's a huge demand to get all this information straight. Um, so I've tr I've tried to like chunk put things into buckets and try to group some of these questions for Lou and Oren. Um, just kind of want to start with um, back to the basics a little bit because there were a lot of questions going into this um, about risk. And Oren, you talked about um, how everyone is at risk. It's just different levels of risk. And you 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 underscored um, seizure control as being one risk factor and low socioeconomic status. Um, can you talk about, um, there were questions around specific seizure types like absence or partial seizures. Um, and can you also talk about how how can people assess their own risk? How do they do that with their healthcare provider? They're good questions. I think I can answer the first one relatively straightforwardly. The shorter the seizure and the absence of convulsive movement. So, for example, an absence seizure or a focal unaware seizure or a focal aware seizure where someone just stares into space for 30 seconds, smacks their lips or may move their hands automatically. Those appear to be extraordinarily low risk events for SUDEP. Um, so I think the ones we really have to worry about are what lay people refer to as grand mal or tonic-clonic seizures. Tonic seizures, which are the kinds that can occur, for example, in people with Lennox Gasto, where someone may just raise their arms for 10 seconds, those do not seem to be associated with SUDEP or, or if so, infrequently like other seizure types. So I think, you know, it's, it's mainly the convulsive seizures. The, the problem, and I think this is the problem that we need to highlight more, is that, for example, generalized epilepsies, which are typically well controlled with medications like juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, people with generalized spike waves on their EG, they're they're kind of our easy cases and they represent way under 1% of the medical literature on epilepsy, but they represent 20, 25% of all people with epilepsy. So it's a huge dichotomy. And it's also true with SUDEP. So everyone thinks of SUDEP as being those treatment resistant focal epilepsy patients who you're thinking about surgery and maybe they can't have surgery because it's coming from several spots. What we found in the North American SUDEP registry is that it's actually pretty common in generalized epilepsies. And the reason I think, and, and Dan Friedman observed this or thought of it first, I think, is that when you break through with focal epilepsy, you probably break through with a focal unaware seizure. You stare into space for a minute, which if you're driving a car is very dangerous. But if you're home alone or with somebody, it's not dangerous at all. If you break through with a generalized epilepsy, it's usually a tonic-clonic seizure. Now, it may be the first one in two years because you missed your meds, because you stayed out late at your brother's birthday party uh, and got caught in traffic coming home and had to wake up at six for work. But the, that one event can be deadly because when they break through, if it breaks through as a tonic-clonic, that's the dangerous one. Thank you for that. Um, there was also a question about nighttime versus daytime. I mean, I think you know, you, you touched on we all think it happens only in the night, but that's not always true. Can you say anything about the daytime? Yeah, no, I think it had, you know, one third of them definitely occur during wakeful hours, um, can be in the shower, could be at a desk at work, could be in the supermarket shopping. So unfortunately, it can occur anytime, anywhere, any place. Sleep is, you know, far more likely on a per hour basis. So it's one third of the time of your day from hopefully for most people, but it's two thirds of the risk for SUDEP. So it's, you know, represents a per hour a far higher risk, but it's not that, you know, there's no, if your kid is in the other room for four hours working on their homework, it doesn't mean something tragic can't happen there. And, and uh, what percent come with a seizure versus not a seizure? As So it's, okay. it's one of the challenges. So the, it, by definition, SUDEP, like sudden infant death syndrome and sudden unexplained death in childhood, the vast majority are not witnessed. Something like 90% of SUDEPs are not witnessed. The ones that occur in sleep, 98% are not witnessed. So the, the challenge is what happens to the, all those unwitnessed cases. So what we do know from epilepsy monitoring units as well, the vast majority follow convulsive seizures. 
Um, what happens at home when they're witnessed? The vast majority follow convulsive seizures. So we don't know how common it is to occur without a seizure or without a convulsive seizure, but presumably pretty un uncommon, at least. Yeah, so many unknowns still. So um, question maybe you both can comment on. There have been lots of questions about um, monitoring at night and which devices you would recommend. I know we're not in the business of recommending any one device over another. And Orin, you talked about how um, science still isn't there, but um, maybe Orin, how do people talk to their doctors about what is their better best device? And then Lou, I know you, you've thought about this a lot after you've lost your daughter and still have to think about it for your living kids. I mean, that's, tough. So I love your different perspectives on that. I think, you know, one way to look at it is that no monitor is going to be perfect. Um, some of them have high false alarm rates, which especially for kids, you know, if a kid starts scratching their ear in the middle of the night and the parents have to run in the bedroom thinking their kid's dying, that can get exhausting after, you know, a week, never mind a year. So there's that balance between true positives and, and false positives. So I think those are some of the things that, you know, the wristwatch devices, which can be part of an Apple watch or the Embrace Empatica or, or some of the more commonly used ones, uh, the SAMI infrared camera, which detects movement and can alarm people in a nearby bedroom. But keep in mind, the monitors only work if someone's nearby. One of the greatest fears is that you've got your kid and they go to college, which is a terribly high risk period for breakthrough seizures, missed meds, alcohol, sleep deprivation. And so they, you know, they can wear a watch or they can have a SAMI monitors that alarm somebody. But if they alarm the parent in Chicago and the child's at school in Evanston, Illinois, that's not going to do any good because they're not going to be able to get to the bedroom in time. So you need someone nearby who can be there. And that's a real problem for adults who live alone. Imagine you're a 30 year old single person in a city. Do you have to like find the person in the apartment next to you if you don't have a partner? who's going to come in your apartment in the middle of the night. So these are, there are a lot of questions that go around monitors. Well, there's no one perfect device, right? But, perfect. but there are resources out there to help assess what is the better device for you. Like Danny did is, is a, a great source to go to. And Lou, why don't you chime in on how you, how you landed on something? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I, I just want to back up a little bit. You know, uh, we all talk about, um, how the neurologists and the epileptologists really aren't doing a good enough job of informing patients about SUDA, because I, I can tell you definitively that if we had been informed, um, we would have taken the handful of precautions that are available to us, including a device like the Embrace Watch and anti-suffocation pillow. Uh, Two of those for, for sure we would have invested in for Brenna. So with that said, um, it, it just gives you a fighting chance, right? I mean, it, it, as Orrin indicated, there are no guarantees that devices uh, are going to prevent a suit up death, uh, but it just gives you, uh, in my opinion, a far better chance at surviving uh, a seizure in the middle of the night that could turn to suit up. So uh, we... Um, Thanks to the Danny Did Foundation, we invested in a device for our son. And so he has the Embrace Watch. And I can tell you, yeah, there, there probably are some false alarms, but the six, seven or eight times that we did a test run with him, because uh, for those of you that aren't aware about this, this device, it it, uh, it alerts up to three different phone numbers almost instantaneously when it detects a seizure. So we did six or eight test runs and they were spot on. And our phones rang within 15 to 20 seconds of that, um, of that seizure type activity um, being simulated. So uh, again, for me, it just boils down to give us a chance. Um, and I, I do believe things like the Embrace Watch uh, can make a difference. Um, unfortunately, fortunately or unfortunately, however you look at it, we'll never really have 
metrics that we can measure, um, you know, to, to say, yes, this saved a life or this prevented a death. Uh, but again, I, I just wanted the opportunity. And I can tell you definitively, again, going back to Brenna, she lived in a, um, in a home with two of her very best friends. Their bedrooms were side by side by side. And so unfortunately, her, this happened in the middle of the night. Uh, her friends were completely unaware that something had happened. And I, I just wonder, um, you know, would an Embrace Watch have done its job and alerted her two roommates? And could they have gotten her out of a prone position? And could they have, you know, started life-saving efforts? I, I, we'll never know, right? But um, uh, I, I think anybody should uh, uh, invest in a device if the, if they have the means to do so. Uh, again, and you might consider multiple devices because I think any single device can fail. You know, someone takes the watch off or the battery dies or something gets unplugged. So for the families that are really worried, I often suggest at least two devices sometimes or even a, sound, a baby monitor, sound monitor can work too. Sure. Someone in the chat asked about CPAP. I don't think it's a great question. I don't know that there's ever been a SUDEP documented in someone wearing a CPAP, which one would imagine would help prevent a SUDEP, but that's speculation. But it's a good good and interesting question. Um, so another common thing we hear all the time, and you all both brought it up, is like, well, okay, why aren't doctors talking about this? You share the shocking numbers, Orrin, of percentages of this neurologist who talk about it. We need all kinds of providers talking about this. There's such frustration. Why does it continue to be so lowly, so poorly discussed, not frequently discussed? And then to pair that with, there are also a few questions around how how do I talk about this and not have my kid feel anxious, right? Like, how do we find some perspective here? Because you were right to say it's not rare, but, it, you know, it it's not common either. So like, how do we find that balance? I think it's hard and I think it's individual and different people respond differently. So I think part of it is that neurologists never learned, you know, when you're when you become an oncologist, a cancer doctor. You pretty much know you're going to be facing some, you know, a woman gets breast cancer, you treat her, then it spreads to her lungs and her lymph nodes and her liver. You know, everybody knows that's bad news. And that's part of your job is to be positive, you know, give people options, but be realistic. And I think for doctors taking care of people with epilepsy, that's never been part of their their mental world of, of how they approach the disorder. It's like, I give you a medication, it doesn't work, I'll change the med, go up on the dose. So I, I do think it's got to start with the residency where people become comfortable and understand this is their opportunity to save lives. The The other side, just to present it, and it's a hard one, uh, and I think you know families don't like to hear it. Laura, uh, Laura Crandall, who Gardner and I know, she lost her 15-month-old child to essentially an unexplained death in sleep, but it wasn't in the first year of life. So it's not SIDS. So there was no word for it, even for the medical examiners or the medical community. And she helped create it. Um, we've later learned, it's just an interesting parenthetical story that's evolving, about a third of those kids, which is a large group, have a history of febrile seizures, which is about tenfold higher than the base rate in the population. So there's no doubt that some of these kids with febrile seizures who technically don't have epilepsy because febrile seizures are not epilepsy, they die from seizures. So it's yet another group where I think SUDEF is killing people, but they're not getting counted. Laura collected a group of videos from parents who happen to have crib cams, basically, um, to be able to see their kids if they're crying, what's going on. And we've got six that had good recordings of, of death and they all look like they were seizures. Only one of the six kids had a history of febrile seizures. So the question is how many SIDS and children who die at age two in their sleep without a history of febrile seizures or epilepsy died from seizures? So, you know, from Laura's perspective, she feels like she needs to go out and educate pediatric neurologists 
about the danger of febrile seizures. And from where she sits, speaking to parents, you know, every week there's a new set of a couple parents who tragically lost their toddler. Um, she has every right to be screaming. From the pediatrician's perspective, they may see a thousand kids with febrile seizures and never experience this. So there's that balancing act that's really hard. Um, you know, a famous thing at some point, they came out with recommendations against 30 year old women who don't have a family history and don't have BRCA genes from getting mammograms. Um, and the reason is that if you, you know, a chance of a 30 year old woman having breast cancer is one in 7,000 and a test that's 73% sensitive and, you know, 12% false positive rate, you're going to be biopsying, you know, 350 breasts for the wrong reason to potentially save three lives and you'll still miss one of the four women with you know, breast cancer. So that becomes part of the, I have parents coming in, absolutely the kid has had one seizure. They've read about SUDEP before they met me. They come in, the kid has an abnormal EG, so they definitely have epilepsy. They probably will get on medications, but they are, they're paralyzed about SUDEP. Can we ever go out to dinner again? I mean, what if the child dies? So there's that side too. You know, sometimes people take information and it sends them off the deep end. Yeah, no, I, I um, we don't want to scare people. We want to empower people. Um, there is a great new resource that is a toolkit uh, for providers to help them learn how to better talk about this topic. They too are afraid to talk about it. And you're right, Orin, they need to be learn about this early in their careers. So preventing epilepsy deaths.org toolkit with video resources for providers to model how to talk about it. But also in there is a guide for patients. It's a three page questionnaire that families can fill out themselves. So they go to their provider and can ask the right questions and share information that can hopefully help a pro provider better assess and personalize somebody's risk um, because not everybody is the same. Um, so I'm gonna ask one more question and maybe Lou, you can, you can um, kick this one off. Um, what, what, what can, what's, if there was one single thing the advocacy community could do, maybe it's not one thing, but, but what should we do as a community? People who are on this call are, are very motivated to learn more. How can we work together to better make progress on this issue? Uh, thanks Gardner. It's a wonderful question. Um, <laughs> We, we have, as you know, uh, we are part of several workshop type groups that meet on a regular basis and, and we talk about things and, and some people have their own foundations, some people don't. I think we just need to pool and combine our resources because uh, we're, we're um, I don't want to diminish anybody's activities, but but sometimes we're just spitballing, right? And um, we just need to pool our resources and uh, don't be afraid to blow up your your local legislators' phones and emails inboxes either, because as Orrin agreed with me, um, you know we need to do a better job of letting our legislators know that. This is a problem, and right now it's kind of uh, stuck in a in a vicious cycle because um, because nobody's trained on it. The medical examiners aren't trained on it, uh, and it doesn't get that um, funding that it that it needs it because everything's underreported. So yeah, I I think we just need to uh, don't be afraid to speak up. Um, I'm astounded at um, where, you know, my journey in all this is 15 months so far and counting. And I'm just astounded uh, how far we've come from advocacy and awareness in just 15 short months. And so I think it's just going to snowball and it's going to get better. Um, but, but just use your voice and speak up and get involved. It's the only way we're going to get noticed. 
Yeah, thank you, Lou. I appreciate that. And I appreciate everything you've done in, in too short a period of time. And Oren, you've done an, just amazing things for this field and the partnership that has been forged between families and providers and researchers in this space, I think is really important in um, creating urgency and continue to drive this faster. Um, we got to we got to go. It's over. And I'm so sorry we couldn't answer all these questions because there are lots of really great and specific questions. So um, reach out. Um, please note that you'll get a, um, a pop up, I guess, in your um, inbox or something to comment on this webinar. We, F Pammy's always looking for feedback on how we can do better. So please let us know. Um, and I hope we see most of you in Florida <laughs> at Disney. Um, in December for the next PAMI conference and stay um, stay tuned for the next webinar and, and send your ideas. But thank you, Lou. Thank you, Orrin, so much for being here with us today and sharing all that you did. Appreciate it. Thank you. My, my pleasure. Take care. Bye.